This is Polyamory Weekly, tales from the front of responsible non-monogamy from a pansexual, kink-friendly point of view. A warning for our under-18 listeners, this is an adult-oriented podcast about really lascivious things like communication and honesty in relationships. If you're under 18 and looking for upfront advice and answers to questions about sex, please visit scarletteen.com. This is Polyamory Weekly, episode 520 for June 8, 2017. Coming up on today's show, Approaching the Swingularity with Cooper Beckett. Coming up on today's show. Hello, everyone. This is your host, Minx, and we have a very fun interview with our good friend, Cooper S. Beckett, who runs the Life on the Swing Set podcast and has just written his third book, Approaching the Swingularity. We're going to get to that in just about 30 seconds. I think the only announcement we have before that is that Lusty Guy has been doing a lot more writing. He has written his second article for Swing Towns, which I've also posted to the Poly Weekly website. Now, this one was on his swinging origin story. Now, he's talked about and posted on the Poly Weekly blog about his poly origin story, but he hasn't talked about his swinging origin story because for many years, both he and Elle self-identified as swingers rather than as poly. So if you're kind of curious about that, or if you're on the swingery side, I'll provide a link to that in the show notes at polyweekly.com. And now without further ado, here's our interview with Cooper. I am absolutely thrilled to have back in the Poly Weekly studios with me, Cooper Beckett. Welcome back. Thank you for having me. I love being on your show. I would say it's been so long, but it hasn't, because you keep cranking out books like there's no tomorrow. Well, this is how I guarantee a yearly slot on the best possible shows, (laughs) is I write another book, and then beg, you know, for for exposure. (laughs) So for those who may not have read your fabulous previous books, tell us, introduce yourself, tell us who you are, and why it is that you're awesome. Oh, well, uh, I'm, I, I will let them determine whether or not or why I'm awesome, but I'm the host of Life on the Swing Set, the podcast, and have been for the last seven years. And uh, as, as one ancient podcaster to another ancient podcaster, as we know, podcast years are different than human years. Um, it's, it's sort of stunning to come to milestones like that. Yes, indeed. And remind us of your previous novels and books. Yes. uh, Well, my first book was My Life on the Swing Set, the very creatively titled semi-memoir that talked about my first five years in non-monogamy. And my second book, which came out last year, is a novel called A Life Less Monogamous. And it's about a young couple uh, just beginning their exploration into the big scary world of swinging. This new book is also a novel, and I went uh, the full George R. R. Martin and decided to have a, a large cast of characters. I went from two characters that are point-of-view characters in the first book to seven in this one. Wow. And we follow uh, four of the people from the first book as they move into a more complex version of non-monogamy. And so this book, uh, Approaching the Swingularity, takes place... Uh, on a swinger resort called Aphrodite's Resort and Spa, which bears some similarity but is legally distinct from Desire <laughs> Resort, where I uh, take a, a, a motley crew every year. And we follow seven characters over the course of a week at this resort as they deal with the intensity and amazing sexuality of the present as well as get wrapped up in the stuff that's going on in their lives and their relationships leading up to the trip. And so I really wanted to use the centerpiece of this resort as an opportunity to tell a story about a the kind of place that most people never get the opportunity to go to. And I'm so glad that you're writing more fiction, because we've had 
at this point, we have plenty of poly books on how mm-hmm. to not how to books on non monogamy and swinging and poly and relationship anarchy and pretty much everything else. Not that we couldn't always use more, but there's not a lot of great fiction, or there hasn't been. But over the last year or two, there's been a lot more, and I'm really pleased that you know fiction is finally keeping up with uh, some of the things that we're seeing on TV, which yeah. is you know t- a, a tad less accurate. <laughs> well, sure, but but it, name dropping like like the first time I heard the word polyamory on New Girl, I got so excited. Yeah, the, and the first time I saw polyamory and the word metamor used appropriately on a TV oh, yeah. show, I'm like, hello. Now it was kind of it's TV, right? So in <laughs> that particular episode, it was like. They were depicting a group marriage with a bunch of people in the forest all wearing matching like long white robes and promising to marry, oh, of course. you know, Bill and June and Dan. And I was like, I don't think <laughs> it's like that. I mean, typically it's like you're you still like it's the couples that do a commitment ceremony and there may be other people involved, but typically it's one to one. It's not like and now I'm marrying seven of you. Right. <laughs> but, you know, points forever. But they're trying. Exactly. They're, they're trying. trying. But you are actually doing because you live this <laughs> life and you know it and yet and you also can write a compelling fiction story. Oh, so well, thank you. You've already uh, you've already written one uh, non-monogamous novel. Why this book? What is in this book apart from seven POV characters? Oh, man. <laughs> well, I, it's it's funny. For the first book I really wanted to tell a simple story. You know, and I wanted to tell it from that point of view of really brand new uh, swingers because it's a big, scary world. And, like, I remember back when I started swinging, reading uh, Tristan Taramino's opening up and getting to the poly chapters and being terrified (laughs) because it seems so undoable before you start it, you know, before you get your mindset right. And so as I was writing the first book, I kept coming up with these things I wanted to address. Like, I wanted to talk about um, bisexual male exploration. I wanted to talk about uh, trans sex. I wanted to talk about real, true development of poly relationships and how it feels to slide from swinging to poly and back. Because that shifting dynamic means that you're never quite certain what your next relationship's going to look like. And that was just way, way too much for these these wide-eyed newbies. <laughs> and way too much for a simple narrative. And so I just kept writing something on a post-it and sticking it on the wall. Writing something on a post-it and sticking it on the wall. And when I finished um, that book, I started thinking about, well, what do I want to do next? And it very quickly became this larger narrative and there's a big play party in the in the middle of the first novel and my initial thought was what if i took all the characters all the other people at that play party and sort of wove a tangential story with them so it would all come through this play party in the middle and it would connect it directly to the previous book but then i really wanted to see the next steps on these characters journeys and go deeper into the veteran swingers who were in the first book who were these pictures of perfection in swinging like they never do anything wrong and instantly my first uh my first thought for the new book is well i want to wreck their relationship yeah you're so mean i am and and you know it's you need to You need to be willing to put characters through horrible things because that's when we see who they really are. So you said your first book was for, your first novel was for wide-eyed newbies. Who Mm -hmm. is this book for? Well, I like to think that uh, there's something to be said about any type of relationship in stories about non-monogamy. Because really, the, the cornerstone of story, any story about non-monogamy is that it's about communication. And, you know, in fiction and drama, it's about the lack of communication. Mm. Because isn't, isn't most swinger and poly relationship drama issues about those times when we're not actually communicating the way we should be? I, I would say that take off the adjectives poly and non-monogamous and swinger and just say all relationship issues period 
Yes. So I think there's there's a story to be told for anyone in here. There's uh, dealing with a partner who you think is out of your league. There's dealing with, um, you know, work issues. One of my characters got fired because of her lifestyle. And there's dealing with the shame that accompanies any exploration in life. There's dealing with the idea that you don't really know who you are sexually. Or you don't know what, you know, the big one for me was I wanted to address the, a big problem in my life, uh, emotionally, is that I have a savior complex. And I want to help everybody who runs through my life. Often whether they want me to or not. Whether they ask me to or not, I want to help, and I have a history of pushing my help on people. Mm. And that's something that I know is a major issue, especially for older people, in, not not old people, but older people in the sex-positive community. Because they see what it looks like when the newbies come in, and they want to help. And they want to help by giving guiding them and shaping them. And often that's not what the newbies want. Indeed. <laughs> so I, I found all these little ideas that are both uh, very much centric to non-monogamy, but also very generalized, uh, applicable to most relationships. And then I put a whole lot of really hot sex in there. I was just about to ask, is, the, is this a sexy book? Are there sex scenes? I, I, should, well, the, I shouldn't even ask. If you wrote it, of course, they're hot sex scenes. Well, the thing I, I I tried to do, and I wrote, when I wrote the first part of the book, I wrote three chapters with sex scenes in a row. And what I found myself doing, and I, found, I was very amused by my obsession with this, is I'm very much a person who can disconnect to a certain point while having sex. And by disconnect, I mean I can focus entirely on the sex and not be worried about my day-to-day -day life to a point. But I'm a neurotic and uh, I'm constantly worried about everything. And so in my sexual life, it's it's the, the ebb and flow of being able to be completely in the moment and then, oh, what's that thing that I'm worried about? And then back to the sex completely in the moment. And then, oh, my God, why am I thinking about it? And then back to the sex. And so all three of these sex scenes have some of the the sexiest stuff I've ever written. Uh, it's it's uh, a, a bareback for the first time for a couple. It's uh, a lesbian sex scene in uh, Sex Swing. And then it's a threesome where the narrator is the middle of the threesome. And while I'm, I'm moving from these sexy, really hot moments, I'm then focusing on, oh, the, the neuroticism of, uh, did I lose enough weight? Do I look hot enough to be here? Why am I actually here? Why am I playing in a phone party? Couldn't I get pink eye? And then, uh, <laughs> pink eye, that's the concern. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is, I mean, it's it my is concern. especially virulent, sure. Okay, yeah. Transmitted <laughs> through touch, sure, sure. I can yeah. see it. And then, um, you know, so I, I really wanted to deal with what it's like to be focused on on the things around you as well as the things in front of you. And so not all of the sex in the book is like that ebb and flow, but a lot of it shows that little part of us that can't let go of what's going on emotionally in our lives. And I really liked playing with that dynamic throughout the book. It sounds like it was fun to write. It, oh, I loved it. What did you learn from writing this book that you didn't learn from writing your other books? <laughs> don't uh, don't overcommit to a story. <laughs> I no, I, seriously. I I uh, the book changed dramatically as I was writing it, which is unusual for me. I'm used to writing with a very uh, specific outline, and I really tried to let myself. Uh, go and let the characters develop themselves. And since it takes place on a resort, I had a list of background characters. And what surprised me is which background characters became important and which ones that I thought were going to be important weren't, ultimately. Like, I have a, a couple that 
are podcasters, the kind of lifestyle podcasters that we all know, where they go places and they podcast about them, and they're snarky and young and obnoxious, because <laughs> we podcasters tend to be obnoxious. But it, I thought they were going to be very important to the story. And then I found as I was writing them that they're, they were better served as background characters. And two characters that I in initially intended only to be part of one scene were like, when they showed up, it's like, okay, well, I need to reconfigure the rest of the book because this person is very important. And so is this person. And that was a cool way to, to work it. So I went from having a very a, a generalized outline. I had a big post-it on, you know, they have those gigantic post-it sheets. I had those on my wall with all the days divided up and little colored post-its for each character. <laughs> and I knew where they were going. I knew what their overarching plot line was. But after a while, I realized that I need to plan what today is going to be. So what, what happens on Tuesday at this resort? And then I need to have a generalized idea what happens on Wednesday, hmm. but I shouldn't plan Wednesday fully until Tuesday is done. And it really, it was an exciting way to work and something completely different than I've ever done before. It sounds like a lot of fun. Is, is there some way you would measure the success of this book apart from just you know, the financial sales? Is, was there a message or you know, some way you would hope to change people who have read this book? Well, there's a, there's a number of ways I look at that. And right off the bat, I feel like I am, I have become, I've been successful in, in the creation here because I was able to include um, the huge variety of sexuality that I wanted to include all across the spectrum uh, from heterosexual to homosexual, all on the Kinsey scale and the variety of, of body types, um, disabled, uh, trans, gay, all these different um, types of people and types of interactions and types of sex. I was able to include almost everything that I wanted to in this story. And for di sheer diversity alone, I feel I was very successful. It sounds like one of your goals was inclusion. Yes. And it was it was very important to me from the beginning that my inclusion be um, <laughs> representatively accurate. Because, you know, I'm middle class cis white male here. And uh, two of my point of view characters are lesbians. One of them is a person of color. And so... As, as I'm writing this, I was very uh, careful to send out chapters as I was going to people who could actually speak to uh, what I was saying and whether or not I was even remotely in the right ballpark. And I'm so pleased that, I mean, there were, there were definite times when there was like, okay, this is wrong here. You just need to change this. But overall, I, I feel like I got close enough that with some tweaks and with some language alterations, I could be somewhat representative. That's actually fairly impressive and pretty brave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Writing I was terrified POV when I sent it out. from a lesbian person of color. Uh, yeah. You could get a lot of criticism for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, thankfully, I have not seen criticism for it yet. Now, you said this book at a resort, a swinger resort, mm -hmm. that is very similar to Desire. And <laughs> yes. I, I have to say, there was a point a couple of years ago when you – I think you had some people that uh, canceled and you were trying to fill some slots. So you messaged me and yes. perhaps some others saying, hey, do you want to go? And I started uh, mentioning this to, to Lusty Guy and I said, all I had to do was say Desire. And his eyes lit up <laughs> like a kid – I mean, horrible uh, – uh, simile, but like a kid in a candy store, he was like practically yes. said yes before I could get the sentence out. Unfortunately, it coincided yeah, the timing with, didn't work out, with right. the vacation that we already had scheduled, tickets bought and paid for. But he was like, oh, so <laughs> I can just say if you ever have any, you know, cancellations, you know, let me know because Lusty Guy will be there in two shakes, I tell you. <laughs> but was there a reason that you said it at specifically at this type of swinger resort? 
Well, it's it's literally the most important place in the world to me. And it's because it's the only place where I feel like, barring some minor things, I'm with my tribe, I'm with my people, I'm with my community. And it's partially because we've we've developed um, this recurring group of people, and we keep bringing new people in, but we're specifically bringing in people who are looking for to explore their sexuality and their boundaries, who are looking to be more inclusive of others. And to be able to share a place like this, like I said, there very few people ever get to visit a place or even know that places like this exist in the world. So to be able to show some of what it feels like to be there and to have that first drink at the bar, to put your feet in the ocean for the first time, and know that you're surrounded by this unbelievable conglomeration of sexy people looking to have the, oh, this wildly hedonistic great time. It's, it's like nowhere I've ever been, and I can't imagine not going there. Again, I'm, I'm 152 days <laughs> from... From going there again right now. And, and actually, just today, we announced that Tristan Terramino is joining us this year in, in Desire. Oh, wonderful. Um, so it's another really exciting uh, bite of that, that queerification of this place. And we're, we're, we're changing things. And so the, the book, once I, once I realized that the, the play party idea was way too limiting... Um, it was immediately clear that it, the sequel needs to take place at this resort. And when I say sequel, it is worth noting that a lot of people who've read it had not read the first book and didn't know necessarily that it was a sequel. So you don't have to read it in either order, the first or the second. Um, Standalone sequel, it's, good. Yeah, it, it was, that was also very important to me because I didn't want to limit it uh, by, by making the first one essential. We've teased my audience, I think, a tad too much now. <laughs> oh, oh. So it's oh. probably about time that we tell them where they can find you and where yes. they can buy this yummy new book of yours. Well, I am at coopersbeckett.com, and you can buy all three of my books. There is ebooks, paperbacks, audiobooks for the first two. The third one is a much more complicated audiobook, so maybe. Um, <laughs> at, 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 did I say coopersbeckett.com? I did. Yes, right? you did. Okay, uh, and uh, it's really um, important to me that if if you if you like what I had to say tonight, you buy it from my website because I'm an independent publisher, and that really means the world to me. If you buy it from Amazon, I'll still be happy, but I prefer CooperSbeckett.com. Uh, you can find my podcast at LifeOnTheSwingSet.com. Uh, it's a weekly podcast about non-monogamy. And you can find me spouting off about politics all the time on Twitter because that's really <laughs> all I have to talk about these days. And and some some sexy, let me be clear. A little bit a little bit of sex, a lot of politics. Yeah. Okay. But I'm Cooper S. Beckett on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all the things. <laughs> awesome. Cooper, thanks so much for coming back on the show and congratulations on your third book. Well done. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. And thanks again to Cooper for taking the time to chat with us about his book. Very exciting, and it's always good to have more non-monogamous fiction out there. With that, we can wrap up the show. I want to thank everybody who has contributed, whether it was as a guest, a co-host, financial support, or by sending in an email or a comment or a correction. We're a free resource. We've helped hundreds of thousands of people navigate their introduction to polyamory. And your donations and purchases of things like books and courses, and frankly, just downloading the podcast, help keep this podcast free for everybody both inside and outside the community. Questions, comments, feedback, email 802-505-POLY, email polyweekly at gmail.com, or you can leave us a comment on our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash polyweekly, or on Twitter at polyweekly or at Cunning Minx. Thanks for listening, and remember, it's not all about the sex. <laughs>